Hi, welcome to this brief presentation. My name is Tim Zerlin. What I want to talk to you about today is a scenario. Imagine we work for a school and we want to look at freshmen who came in after their first year. We can look at their GPAs and then go back and look at their SAT scores and their high school GPAs. What we want to do is we want to see is it possible to construct some kind of formula where if we have the SAT scores and the high school GPA, can we predict how they're going to do in the university GPA? And to do this, we're going to need to use something called multiple regression. Well, there's no need to panic. That might sound kind of scary and intimidating, but it's actually pretty easy. Normally, you need a sophisticated statistical software, but I'm going to show you how you can do it in Excel. Under the Data tab, you might see something called Data Analysis. We're not seeing that. If you don't see it, you need to just click on your button up here, Excel Options, and click Add-ins and see what's active and inactive. We want to make active the analysis tool pack. Go. Go ahead and select that. Okay. Okay, so now if we click on the data tab, you can see we have something called data analysis over here. And I'll go ahead and run a data analysis. Specifically, I'm going to run a regression. Okay, so once you run that analysis, it's going to go ahead and pump out all this information for you here. Uh, specifically, we're going to look down here at our coefficients to go ahead and build a multiple regression equation. So we have our equation there. And what this is telling us is that this allows us to make predictions for our university GPA. We take our first coefficient, add that to second coefficient times the SAT score, and add that to the third coefficient times the high school GPA. Now we have a lot of information here and let's just look at it quickly, the important things. R squared, that's the coefficient of determination. In this case, it's telling us that 74.8% of the variability in the university GPAs is explained by the SAT scores and the G high school GPAs. Um, standard error, S, um, I prefer to call it the residual standard deviation. Uh, this is the typical deviation between actual university GPAs and what the model says it should be is 0.335, which is not too bad. Okay, so that brings us to our multiple regression equation. And a good way to think about this is maybe something like a line of best fit. We're going to build this line and then we can make predictions where the point would fall on that line. In this case, it's actually, there's an added dimension, so it's actually more like a plane of best fit. So it may be easier to think of it as a line. And a line can extend infinitely in either direction. So we can now extrapolate data that's not on our chart over here um, to the point of absurdity. So in, in this case, our intercept is negative 1. And that means if we had a 0 on the SAT score, which is impossible, and a zero high school GPA, we would actually end up with a negative um, college GPA, university GPA, which again is impossible, but again, that's just extrapolating. Okay, so let's plug in some more useful data. Okay, let's say we had two students apply to our hypothetical school, and these were potential incoming freshmen. Student one had a 1200 SAT score with a 2.75 high school GPA and student two had a 900 SAT score with a 3.2 GPA. Which one could our model, which one would our model predict would have a higher GPA? Well, if we run it through there, see student one would be slightly more successful predicted by our model. Well, how accurate is this? Let's take a look. So what we can take here is a 95% prediction interval. Unfortunately, Excel doesn't have a function for doing this. If it were just a simple regression, we could use a formula, but for multiple regression, it's much more complex and would require a linear algebra. But what we can do is we can take an estimate. So in this case, take an approximate 95% prediction interval, and we'll look at these various measures. Now for the t value, since it's 95%, it would basically be 2, but there's a built-in function, tinv, comma, and we're going to do for 0.05, and we would use the degree of freedom from the residuals, which is 18. See it there? And there we have our t value, which is, like I said, almost 2. Now, 
The hardest to derive would be the standard error predictions. And in this case, what we're going to do is look at our standard error, or our residual standard deviation, S, and inflate it by 10%. So I will take S and multiply by 1.1. And that's going to give us an approximate standard error. We know that this, the standard error prediction is slightly larger than standard error. Now it's a, a little bit of a, a simplification, but it's again approxim, approximation. Now our margin of error is going to be our t value times our standard error prediction. And for our lower bound, we're going to take our point of prediction. So in this case, our university GPA, what we predicted it would be, was this. And we're going to subtract that from our margin of error. And for our upper bound, we're going to again take our predicted GPA, and we're going to add that to the margin of error. And our interval width is simply going to be the upper bound minus the lower bound. Okay, so what is this saying? If our if we had a student who scored 1,200 on the SAT and had a 2.75 high school GPA, from our multiple regression equation, we could predict that the student would have a 2.64. Now, we could say with approximately 95% um, that the student would fall in the range of either a 1.87 to up to a 3.42. We would be 95% that this student would fall into that range. Now, that's for just this one student. Let's take a look at the other student. Okay, for our second student, I'm just going to pretty much use the same values here. Note that the further that our scores would be from the mean of the data that we've used, the larger that our standard error prediction would go up. Um, but in this case, it's just an approximation, so I'm going to use the same value. And in this case, for our student number two, we predicted that they had a 2.5, they would have a 2.5 GPA. The lower bound would be 1.73 and ranging to the upper bound of 3.28. So note that if we had a very conservative program, um, and we wanted a probability of 95% that the students would be successful, neither of these students would be admitted um, because they, they would, on the lower bound, they'd have fa failing uh, GPAs, even though we would predict that their GPAs would be in the mid 2.0 range. Okay, now one of the things that we didn't talk about with all of this is that when we're doing these kind of tests, there's certain assumptions that are taking place. So let's talk about those assumptions. So whenever you do multiple regression, you have certain assumptions. First one we'll talk about is variables are normally distributed. If you have a lot of outliers, for example, this is going to skew your data, throwing off your results. There's actually some statistical programs that can strip out those outliers and clean up your data. Another assumption would be that there's a linear relationship between the independent and dependent variables. We can see in our first scatter plot of the residuals, we have this curve in the data. This is curvilinear, not linear, and this will throw off our results. Here we have a linear relationship. We don't see any curve. It's distributed evenly um, along the x-axis. The third is that variables are measured reliably, without error. So in this case, if we if we had some unreliable data, this can um, overestimate the text size and off the results. The fourth one that's important is the, uh, the assumption of homocidacity. So if we look at our scatter plot, um, this would show homocidacity things. This, the points, data points are evenly distributed along the x-axis or y0. And our second one, this would be heterocidacity we're seeing a pattern, something like a bow tie, and in this middle range here, something's going on that's reducing the variance among the residuals. Okay, let's go ahead and look now at the data that we actually just worked with at the college. 
um, the high school GPAs and, and um, SAT scores and see if that met our assumptions. Okay, so that brings us back to our original data with our SAT scores and our high school GPA. Now, this could all be done in Excel, but it's a little bit more complicated to create the graphs and that we're going to see. Um, I find it's much more easy to run that in SPSS, which is what I use to run this data and to examine um, whether this fits the assumptions of multiple regression. So the first thing we're going to look at is a scatter plot of the residuals versus the fitted values or predicted values. Um, when we look at this plot, what we want to see is a ran random scatter of points. We draw a line across the zero here. What we want to see is the data that's fairly evenly distributed as we look across the scale. What we don't want to see is patterns in the data. Now to look at if our error terms are normally distributed, first we'll look at this histogram of the residuals. And what we want to see is that this falls into this bell-shaped curve. Now in our case, n equals 21. It's not a very large sample size. If it, w if it were normally distributed, the larger n was, the more closely it would fall under this bell-shaped curve. But we're starting to see the pattern there. And it looks mildly bell-shaped. Now the next thing that we can look at is a normal probability plot of residuals. If it was normal, it, was going, it would fall on this straight line running across here. We can see some deviation, nothing too bad. Um, in general, it looks like this does meet the assumptions of multiple regression. And that would mean that we can use our model to predict university GPA from SAT scores and from high school GPA. Thanks for your time. Thank you.